This is Get the Balance Right, a podcast for female entrepreneurs who are totally stressed out over money and managing their busy lives. I'm your host, Heather Zeitzwolf, profit advisor and money coach. I help my clients run more profitable businesses. I take the mystery and confusion out of their numbers so they can reach their financial goals. Join us for a holistic approach that supports a healthy lifestyle while obtaining financial freedom. Stop freaking out. It's time to get the balance right. Hello and welcome to another episode of Get the Balance Right podcast. I am your host, Heather Zeitzwolf. Our guest today is financial expert, Michelle Arpin Bagina. She is a financial advisor who is a certified financial planner, a CFP, and a certified investment management analyst, CIMA. Michelle comes to us with over 25 years of experience in this field and was twice named one of Worth Magazine's Best 250 Financial Advisors. On this episode, we are talking all about the origin of our money mindset. Our unique experiences, especially during childhood through young adulthood, form our behaviors around money. As entrepreneurs, every decision we make in our business impacts our finances, and every financial decision is influenced by our money mindset. Think about that. The root of how you sell how you price, how you spend, how you borrow are all influenced by your money mindset. I want you to think about yesterday. How did you feel? Were there times when you felt stressed out? If you have a scarcity mindset, I want you to imagine what feelings you would have had yesterday if you had an abundancy mindset. Think about it. Would most of your stress be gone? A scarcity mindset can lead to behaviors such as being too pushy and desperate during a sales conversation. Oh, God. But imagine what the same meeting would look like with an abundancy mindset. Your approach would be completely different, right? Despite what type of mindset you have, chances are it was largely formed when you were a kid. And these memories have contributed to the foundation of all of your financial decisions. In this episode, you will learn about what shapes our mindset and how we can break free of our limiting beliefs and, as a result, start making more profit in our business and build financial stability in our lives. We all have our own money stories. These are the memories that have consciously and unconsciously impacted our relationship with the almighty dollar. When I think of my money story, I think about me as a kid sitting on my bed, taking the stopper out of my piggy bank and dropping all the contents onto my bed, the dollars, the coins, and making stacks of dollars. I loved my piggy bank. This fun, interactive relationship that I had with counting my money makes sense that I am an accountant. But then there's the other aspect of my childhood. As a kid, I grew up with parents that lived through the Depression. As such, that instilled a real scarcity mindset into my head. My parents would use something until it completely broke down and it wasn't until it was held together with duct tape and bubble gum that they would buy something new. When I was a child, we were robbed and that also had an effect on me. It made me feel that money could be taken away from me at any time and I'd have to be very protective of my money. All of these different stories are the culmination of my money mindset now. It does affect everything in my business. My parents instilled in me being cheap, and that makes it really difficult for me to pay for help in my business, even though I know that I need it. It's something that really holds me back. This other idea of being robbed as a child makes me feel like, my money could disappear. And I have to be very careful that someone might try to rip me off. All of these things tell a story. And it's from these stories that we can learn more about ourselves and the decisions that we make so that we can modify our behavior. Decisions in our business that will be more productive, better for our business. 
What about you? How are your money stories affecting your financial decisions? Besides being a CPA, I'm also a profitability and money coach. I help my clients change their money habits. These changes, whether large or small, always start with an understanding of their money mindset. It's through this understanding that change can really happen. What about you? How are your money stories affecting your financial decisions? To help you get in touch with your money mindset, I'm offering you a free workbook. Just go to getthebalancerightpodcast.com forward slash mindset to download the workbook. That's getthebalancerightpodcast.com forward slash mindset. You can also follow the link in the show notes. Just look for the free money mindset workbook. Oh, and if you want, you can sign up for my free workshop. Just go to getthebalancerightpodcast.com forward slash workshop. To help us dive into this topic further, we are joined by our guest, Michelle arpin Bagina. Besides having a passion to help her clients build wealth, she is fascinated with financial psychology and has been certified in financial therapy. All right, here is my conversation about the stories behind our money mindset. Michelle arpin Bagina, welcome to Get the Balance Right podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so thrilled to be here with you, Heather. I am super excited because you are not only a financial advisor, but you are an expert when it comes to money mindset. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Before we dive into all of that, I'd just like to know a little bit about you and your background. You know, my background really goes all the way back to my childhood. I was exposed to the emotional hooks that money have in people by observing my parents growing up. And it just really piqued my interest what was going on in the house. There are lots and lots of stories I can tell you. But what I always say is I turned a morbid curiosity into an obsession and that turned into a profession, basically. And I'll give you three capstone stories from growing up. So the first was when I was about six years old, my first memory of money was my dad asking if he could borrow money from my piggy bank. And I asked him, what do you need it for? A badass question for a six-year-old. And he said, cigarettes. And I said, no, you can't have the money. And he took it anyway. That's terrible. Yeah. Yeah, I'm totally going to throw my parents under the bus and then I will redeem them by the time we're done with our conversation today. All right, sounds good. So fast forward to when I was about 10 or 12 years old, my father always wanted a Jaguar, the car, not the cat. And he had an opportunity to buy one at a great price. My mother happened to have been away visiting some family. My brother and I went home with dad. She said no, and he bought it anyway. And he garaged the car I remember thinking to myself, do you think she's not going to notice when she comes home was the first. The second was I felt so crummy because when she called home, we had to keep it a secret. So it was awful. Fast forward to when I'm 17. Now, I grew up hearing you'll be the first to go to college. You're smart. I loved school growing up. My father even took me on college campus tours and on a complete whim, about a month after I graduated high school, he bought a yacht with the money that was earmarked for my tuition. Wow. I grew up to help people explore and transcend their money beliefs because the 10 or 12 year old inside of me was watching it and looking at my parents who were very hardworking, ran a very successful business, made a lot of money. And they were a hot mess with it, but they had all the ingredients to do it so well. And I remember observing and being that kid that was like, in my head, if you two could just get out of your own way, like this could be really cool. And I was powerless to help them. I was a kid. I just sensed this, but I didn't have the skills or the guts to say to my parents, like, knock it off. The path I got on was becoming a financial advisor. I actually thought I wanted to be a CPA like you. And when I got exposed to the financial services world, I realized I don't want to be a CPA. I want the other letters. I want to be a CFP. And that's what started my journey. I know some of my stories are a little bit hard to relate to because Jaguars, boats, yachts, private airplanes growing up. What nobody knew was that my parents were down to their last five bucks 
every single time they bought one of those high ticket items. So it was very rich, poor, rich, poor. It was really insecure growing up. That's what led me to then study the technical aspects of financial planning, investment management, all of the traditional stuff. And then behavioral economics was really starting to get out of the ivory towers of the academic institutions. And I really started studying that and then financial therapy, which is emerging. So I just blend it all together. It's just a very humanistic approach because we all have a relationship with money, which I always think is such a weird thing to say because no, we have relationships with people, but yet money animates our life. It touches every aspect. And if we don't pay attention to it, in fact, if we outright neglect it, it's not going to be there for us. Like we'd want a friend to be, right? So you can think about it in those analogies. A lot of times I have found that it's really discovering the scripts that you took in and subconsciously you're just operating automatically out of those. So there is an inner four or seven-year-old running the show without us knowing. There's what we heard. So money grams, what our parents say to us. And then there are flashpoints. So 17 standing on a dock and there's a yacht bobbing in the water and you find out you're not going to college. That's a flashpoint, right? So that's bound to change in life. But we all have those experiences. It's just nobody's teaching us to, as an adult, re-experience them, re-examine them and decide for yourself. Did the thing I made this mean for my life when I was much younger, is that really what it means? Let's unpack some of these things that you've been talking about. First off, I think that people can definitely relate to your experience, even though maybe it's a yacht. For other people, it could be a lower ticket item, but it's still a very relatable story. My money background started with having parents that grew up during the Depression. I grew up with that sort of money mindset all around me. Having the impact from your childhood, where does their mindset also build from around money besides their childhood? That's a great question. Most of it is from childhood, but it's mainly through the experiences that we have with other adults. So primarily our parents, but it also can be other influential adults, maybe close friends of the family or an aunt and uncle, cousin, adult influences, Cultural influences, of course, our background and religious beliefs can really have an impact. And then what era did we grow up in? Like perfect example, your parents, right? They lived through the depression. I'm sure they were saving their tinfoil and the wrapping paper. Even today, what they're talking about is the experience of COVID and this generation that's going to come up and how it will impact the way they handle money will probably be very different than the impact of other generations. How does your money story shape our behaviors? A lot of it is the beliefs that you have. I know somebody who his first job out of college, he was an investment banker. He was working crazy hours, working his tail off, making tons of money. And at the end of five years, he had a thousand dollars to his name. And he was really unhappy, the amount of work and the little to show for it. And he got some help for that and realized that he internalized that message. Money isn't important. And when he realized that, he said, oh, that's how I've been treating it. That's why I don't have any. That's all it took to put him on a completely different path. So that experience of my client hearing money isn't important. That was a belief that he internalized. So his behavior became, I make it, I spend it because it's just not important to have it. So it affects our behavior in terms of how we perceive it in terms of time. It affects our behavior in terms of how we earn it how we spend it, how we save it, how we invest it. So there are basically four underlying subconscious beliefs. One is money is bad. So therefore people with money are bad. So if you come into money, it must make me bad. So I'm going to get rid of it. That goes on, right? That's an avoidance. Money worship is the belief that more money will fix all my problems. It's sort of like when I can get back into the size four jeans, my life will be perfect. But the belief there, that can lead to workaholism is one symptom of that. Always chasing more money because you just think it'll magically fix everything. Money status, that's probably the most visual script. We see it, people wear it, people drive it. But the underlying belief is, my net worth is my self-worth. And then the last one is money is private. And that's actually a tough one. Money is private. People tend to save for a rainy day. If they lost their job, they're the ones that are really going to flip out about it. It's all about safety and security, but they're also very private, 
right? So there's a difference between privacy and secret. They borderline like secret. And this sounds like a really nice problem to have, but it's not. They can hoard their money. And what I mean by that is these can sometimes be the people that literally go out of the office in a casket. They don't know when they have enough. They don't quit and enjoy their life or they attempt to do that and they find that they have a very hard time spending any money for any type of enjoyment. So each one, none are bad, none are good. They just are what they are. And we have a little bit of each of these in us. We're usually predominant in one or two, a little bit more. So it sounds like our behaviors with money are not only influenced by childhood, but it's like deep in our psyche. So if we want to change our money behaviors, maybe we're in one of those groups, maybe we're the secret type and we would like to be able to spend our money or enjoy life. How does one move from one to the other? Is that through financial therapy, through a money coach? How would you describe the best route to take for that? I think there's two parts that I'm going to answer your question. The first is sometimes it's a matter of information. Doing a financial plan and showing someone the numbers, quote unquote, is enough. And they're going, okay, I see it. I believe it. If numbers don't work, then it's emotional. Then it's that really deep, it's in your DNA kind of stuff. And you're not even aware of it. How do you become aware? You can have a financial advisor who's therapeutic and you can talk to them. There's a really interesting stat. It was actually horrifying to me when I read this. There's a a survey fairly recently that states 64% of people with a financial advisor do not feel like they have anyone to talk with about their money. Interesting. Wow. That is really, that is a scary stat. Yeah. I was pretty dumbfounded with that. And I thought, what the hell are you talking about (laughs) with your advisor, right? What that stat really reveals is that there's this line we draw between, okay, I will tell you how much money I make and the balance is in my account, how much I'm saving and what my goals are. But I'm not veering into that territory of opening myself up for any sort of social judgment or criticism, which is that's the kind of talking that you need. Let me describe the process and then I'll mention some of the helpers. The process is really, I would say it's a little bit of a cross between an FBI hostage negotiation and 12-step program. (laughs) Oh, tell me more. What I mean by that is it's admitting that there's a problem. There's a difference between admitting there's a problem and saying to yourself that you're a problem. Let's go back to my parents for a second. I call them high performance defiant. That's what they were. They kicked ass, but in this one column of their life, they were a mess. Okay. But they were great people and they were really successful. And I don't believe that phrase that how you do anything is how you do everything. I think that is a complete myth. There's different roles. There's different contexts to our lives. We want different things out of different parts of our life and we act accordingly to what we want. The relationship we have with our spouse at home with money might be very different than how we negotiate in our office about money. We bring all that to the table. The negotiation I'm talking about is that process of awareness. And it might be just a review awareness of the experiences, not necessarily reliving them, but just take a little trip down memory lane. What did I make those mean? What had really happened? What facts did I have then that I learned now that I didn't know then? The money grams, which lead to the money scripts. Just gaining all of that awareness when there's an area about our finances that we say, okay, this is a problem. I need to fill in the blank, do more of something, do less of something. Then it's really clarifying your thoughts. It's clarifying your feelings, and then it's negotiating with yourself of, okay, is raising all of this awareness now giving me the ability to change my behavior? And if that is not changing, if you have a sincere commitment to, I want to start saving more, for example, and you're just not making it happen, that's when I think you have to step into a conversation with another human being. You know, you can pick somebody that you can do no wrong, Or you could pick somebody that their opinion would really count. Everybody's got a different personality of who that would be. And I'm talking about not a professional, but someone in your personal world. What you want to receive from that person is you want to be what I call overstood. What is that? Tell us. Overstanding is when somebody knows our stories. They know where they come from. It does not matter if our stories make sense to them. What matters is they can see how our stories make sense to us. They receive it. 
And that's how they are with it. And sometimes it's just enough like to get it out of your system. Of, I'm really screwing up and I'm not exactly sure why, but I think if I give this some voice and get it the heck out of my body, I think this is going to really help me. What most people tell me when they work with me is I've actually never told anybody that, oh my God, I feel so much better. And I didn't even know I needed to feel better. Like we just do feel better when we talk about this stuff. The hardest part is that negotiation that we have wanting help on one hand and then the risk of social pain on the other. I'm telling you, that's the hardest part, but that's an internal negotiation. That's the good news. Because even stepping into the conversation, you've already done most of the hard work just by facing that. So the types of people that can really help is a financial advisor, a financial therapist. What is that? A financial therapist is a mental health professional who has been trained in finance and vice versa, a financial advisor who has been trained in the modalities of financial therapy. One is a financial advisor with therapeutic and one is a therapist with a little financial advising. You can go to a straight up therapist. Very few and far between though, are taught anything about money. I want to go back to some of the stuff that you talked about. For me as a CPA, I know people come to me and they have a lot of fear and anxiety, and they have this fear of being judged about their situation with their money, their taxes, all of that. And I can see how that percentage that you were talking about with the financial advisor could ring true because when people come to me, they're like, my last CPA, when I would have conversations with them, I had no idea what they were talking about, but I was too afraid to ask. It is one of those things where we have to pull down the barriers. So once we get this feeling of shame put aside, how can people start moving towards the direction that they want to go besides the therapy and all of that? Right now, a lot of people are talking about abundance mindset and where if people have this sort of barrier when it comes to money, like you were talking about, maybe they think money is evil and all of that. What are some ways that they can start changing their mindset? I always answer questions like this only with the stuff that I actually do. I always seem to be on this quest of I'm highly aware of the parts of myself that I want to improve. My favorite tool to use is to write out a description of how I want it to be. But then I internalize it. I might write a paragraph or two. And what I'm really talking about is literally you're changing part of your identity. If you're really serious about this, we all have to be serious about our money because it's a life force, right? The way I go about it is I memorize it. The way I memorize is I write it and I rewrite it. So I will read what I've written and then I'll put it aside and I'll start writing it and I'll keep going back and forth. I'll look at it and then I'll try to write it. So I'll keep checking, did I write it properly? And I'll do it in layers, a sentence at a time. As soon as I think I have that first sentence, I start layering in the second sentence. So let's say it's two paragraphs. I'm just gonna keep repeating that process. I'm starting from the beginning, writing it through, adding that next sentence. It's, it's actually deciding, this is who I wanna be with money. This is what I'm gonna embody. And this is how that person acts around money. So the first step is figuring that out, writing yourself a little paragraph about it, and then the process of memorizing it. And then if you take the next step and actually set it to someone, I'm telling you, by the time you got to that place, you will be it. Your subconscious will actually take it in because that's really what we're talking about. I love that. It almost becomes your self mantra through that process over and over again. You start to embody this. That's great. When it comes to this idea of money shame, do you think that it is more apparent in women or in men or just affects everybody? Somebody get me Brene Brown because I have a question for her. And the question is, I want to know if money shame is worse than every other shame on the planet. I think the answer is no. I think shame is shame. I think both men and women suffer from it. And I think in different ways. You've studied financial therapy. What are some ways that people can benefit from that? If we go back to what we were just talking about a few minutes ago around internalizing a new way of being, I call it self-serve therapy. You don't always need to be working with a human being. There's a lot of stuff that you can just do yourself. But the study of financial therapy is relationships and money, the behavioral economic side, which is really got a lot to do with our biology of how we're hardwired to make decisions. For example, loss aversion. Loss aversion is fear of failure in English. That's what it is. 
some of the decisions that we make because we're playing not to lose instead of playing to win. And that will work against us financially. So that's in our system. Again, that goes back to being aware. What are some ways that people can get in touch with their money mindset? There is a money scripts assessment tool that's available online. It's through the Klontzes. They're a father-son team that they're really the founders of the financial therapy movement. It's one of the best assessments I've seen. That's one way you can identify your scripts. And then the other is really taking that little trip down memory lane that we talked about. It's just look at your experiences. The dramatic doesn't necessarily have to be traumatic, but we've had some dramatic money events in our life, positive and negative. What did you hear growing up? And just re-examine that as an adult. And if you're in a relationship, this is where it can get really interesting. One thing we didn't talk about is all of this generational too. So our money beliefs and scripts Think about it. When you're sitting at your dining room table with your you know, significant other, it's not just the two of you sitting there having a money conversation. It's your parents that are there, your grandparents that are at the table with you. They're all there. And the fact that we don't talk about our money at all, we have no idea. We just know that we're butting heads and we don't really understand why. But if you trace the roots of your family tree from a money perspective, if you look at what role financially did my mom and dad play and their parents? Go back as far as you can, other you know, close relatives and family. But if you look at the roles that people played and the attitudes that people had around their family members and their money, it's going to reveal a lot. It's very eye-opening. I highly recommend that in families because there's nothing worse than two people trying to live their lives in harmony and they're just coming at their money from different perspectives. I think a lot of what drives us is our values. So some of how we can know we're out of sync is just looking at our values. Do we value family, work, health, travel, adventure, whatever it is. And when we look at what we're earning and what we're spending, are our values aligned? That's usually a pretty good catalyst too. When something's off about money, that's a good place to look for clues. Especially for couples because money could destroy a relationship. They have to be in sync with that. Do you work with people as couples if they are married or do you work with them individually? How do you go about planning out their financial features? If I'm working in my financial advising capacity and they're married, it has to be with both of them. There's always a division of labor of who does what financially, but they have to both be involved because there's decision-making what we are or are not going to be doing with our money. It's really Mm -hmm. getting at that base level of this is what we would like our life to be like. My favorite question to ask is what does wealth mean to you? That will expose all of the significant events in your life. Why do you believe that? Why do you want that? What experience did you have growing up that made you think that's important or made you want to experience that in your life? All the values are going to show up and all the important people in that person's life are all going to show up. You're going to find out who they want to take care of, what they think they are or are not responsible for, and their values. When you start surfacing that kind of stuff, you're starting to understand each other. And then you can start having those kind of concrete conversations. Interesting. So now I'm thinking when it comes to financial therapy, that couples may actually go to this together. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. So this is kind of a different form of couple therapy. Michelle, how can people work with you and get in contact with you? Where do you hang out on the social media and where are the best places for people to find you? Thanks for asking. LinkedIn and Instagram are my favorite social channels. I have something special on my website, which is michelleab.com. It's Michelle with two L's, ab.com. There is something I put together called the success formula guide. It goes back to that concept. How we do one thing is not how we do everything. And what it helps people do is walk through two or three of their major life successes in any part of their life and they map it. So they're looking at what were their resilience strategies? What were their adherence strategies? How did they use their psychological capital? Psychological capital is what did you know? What did you have? Who were you being? And who did you know? So how did you tap into all that magic? Because everybody has their own 
formula for success, but we never stop and really think about it. I do work with people in group coaching. I work with them individual coaching, and I do have a book and a class in the works. So that's all coming, but right now it's individual or in group orientation. Nice. Okay, great. We'll have the information about all of that in the show notes. Thank you so much, Michelle, for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. 